Gentlemen, I call your attention to that fact. Remember, if you please, that I've spent the better part of my life not on a speaker's platform, but in the country, not in the lecture hall, but in the temple of nature, not in drawing rooms and reception chambers, but in the solitude of my study. I should not like you to attend my lectures with unwarranted hopes, expecting to find an eloquent and brilliant speaker. Since thus far I've communicated with the public exclusively through my written works, since I've devoted my happiest hours, my best energies, and my whole mind to my writings, and owe my name and reputation to them alone, it seems only natural that I should take my books as the foundation and guideline of these lectures. Accordingly, they will serve as my text. My role in speaking will be that of a commentator. My purpose, then, in delivering these lectures is to explain, to elucidate, to demonstrate what I've said in my books. What makes this seem all the more fitting is that I tend to write with the utmost brevity and succinctness, confining myself to the most necessary and essential, omitting all tedious transitions, leaving all self-evident parentheses and consecutive clauses to the reader's intelligence, thereby exposing myself to extreme misunderstandings, as the critics of my works amply demonstrate. But before I name the works I have chosen as the text of these lectures, it seems advisable to give a brief survey of my literary work as a whole. My works can be divided into two groups, those dealing with philosophy as such, and those concerned more specifically with religion or the philosophy of religion. To the first group belong my history of modern philosophy from Bacon to Spinoza, my Leibniz, my Pierre Bailey, a contribution to the history of philosophy and of mankind, my philosophical critiques and principles. To the second belong my thoughts on death and immortality, the essence of Christianity, and finally, the explanations and additions to the essence of Christianity. <clears throat> But regardless of this classification of my writings, all have, strictly speaking, only one purpose, one intention and idea, one theme. This theme, of course, is religion or theology, and everything connected with it. I'm one of those who very much prefer a fertile one-sidedness to a sterile, futile versatility and prolixity, who throughout their lives have only one purpose in mind, upon which they concentrate all their powers who study widely and intensively and never cease to learn, but who teach only one thing and write about only one thing. And the conviction that such single-mindedness is the only means of exhausting a subject and accomplishing something in the world. Accordingly, I've disregarded religion and theology in none of my works, though of course I have treated this central concern of my thinking and my life in different ways according to the time of writing and the viewpoint of each particular work. Since I'm obliged to admit that before publishing the first edition of my History of Philosophy, I deleted all direct references to theology, not for political reasons, but out of youthful caprice and antipathy. In the second edition, however, which was reprinted in my collected works, I filled in these gaps, though from my present rather than my original point of view. The first name that this work mentions in connection with religion and theology is that of Francis Bacon, the father of modern philosophy and natural science, as he's often, and not without justification, been called, because he solemnly professed that he had no intention of applying to religion and theology the profane critique which he developed in the field of science, that he was an unbeliever only in human matters, but in divine matters an absolute and utterly submissive believer. Many regard him as the model of a scientist who is a pious Christian. It was he who wrote the famous words, A little philosophy inclineth men's minds to atheism, but depth in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. A statement which, like so many statements of past thinkers, was once a truth, but is so no longer, although it is still upheld by our historians who draw no distinction between past and present. But in my account of Bacon, I show that in dealing with physics, he negated the principles he professed in matters of faith and theology.
I showed that the old manner of considering nature, teleology, the doctrine of intentions or purposes in nature, was a necessary consequence of the Christian idealism which derives nature from a being who acts with purpose and consciousness, and that Bacon deprived the Christian religion of the all-encompassing character it had held for the true believers of the Middle Ages. I showed that he applied his religious principles only as a private individual, but not as a physicist or philosopher, not in that aspect of his thinking, which was to exert an historical influence. And that it was therefore quite mistaken to regard Bacon as a religious Christian scientist. <clears throat> the second thinker, to present an interest from the standpoint of the philosophy of religion, is Bacon's younger contemporary and friend Hobbes, known chiefly for his political views. He was the first modern philosopher to be stigmatized as an atheist. The learned gentlemen, it is true, have long argued the point. Was he really an atheist? I've settled the argument by pointing out that he was just as much a theist as an atheist. Like modern thinkers in general, he posits a god. But this Hobbesian god is to all intents and purposes no god at all. For Hobbes identifies reality with corporeality so that according to his own philosophical principle, his god, to whom he is unable to impute any corporeal predicates whatever, is a mere word and no being at all. The third significant thinker, though from the standpoint of religion, he does not essentially differ from the first two, is Descartes. However, I did not deal with his attitude towards religion and theology until later, and my Leibniz and Bailey, because it was only after the appearance of my first volume that Descartes came to be proclaimed the model of the religious and specifically Catholic philosopher. But I showed that Descartes, the philosopher, and Descartes, the believer, were two diametrically conflicting individuals. The most original, and as regards the philosophy of religion, the most significant, figures I treated in the same volume are Jacob Bohme and Spinoza, both distinguished from the other philosophers mentioned by the fact that they not only describe the conflict between faith and reason, but that each sets forth independent doctrines concerning the philosophy of religion. The first, Jacob Bohme, is the idol of the philosophizing theologians or theist. The other, the idol of the theological philosophers or pantheists. Bohme's admirers have recently advertised him as the best antidote to the poison of my ideas, the ideas underlying the present lectures. In connection with the second edition of my book, however, I re-examined Bohme in detail, and my renewed study merely corroborated my first conclusion, namely that the secret of his theosophy is on the one hand a mystical philosophy of nature, and on the other hand a mystical psychology, and accordingly, that his work does not refute, but rather substantiates my view that all theology consists in two things, a doctrine of nature and a doctrine of man. The same volume concludes with Spinoza. He is the only modern philosopher to have provided the first elements of a critique and explanation of religion and theology, the first to have offered a positive opposition to theology, the first to have stated, in terms that have become classical, that the world cannot be regarded as the work or a product of a personal being acting in accordance with aims and purposes. The first to have brought out the all-importance of nature for the philosophy of religion. I was glad to express my unstinting admiration and respect for Spinoza. I found fault with him only for continuing, under the influence of the old theological ideas, to define this being who does not act with purpose, will, or consciousness, as the most perfect being, in short, as the Godhead, and so barring himself from a development which would have led him to look upon conscious man as a mere part, or to employ Spinoza's term, a mode, of the unconscious totality, and not as its summit and fulfillment. The opposite pole to Spinoza is Leibniz, to whom I have devoted a special volume, if Spinoza is to be honored for having made theology the handmaiden of philosophy, the first modern German philosopher earned the honor, or dishonor, of having once again tied philosophy to the apron strings of theology.
In this respect, Leibniz, in his celebrated The Odyssey, outdid all others. It is generally known that Leibniz wrote this book out of gallantry towards a queen of Prussia, whose faith had been troubled by Bailey's doubts. But the lady for whom Leibniz really wrote, and whom he really courted, was theology. Even so, the book did not suit the theologians. Leibniz sat on the fence between the two parties, and for this very reason satisfied neither. He wished to offend no one, to hurt no one's feelings. His philosophy is a philosophy of diplomatic gallantry. Even the monads, the entities of which in his view all sensible beings consist, exert no physical influence on one another, lest any of them suffer injury. But a man who is determined to offend no one, even unintentionally, can have no energy, no force, for it is impossible to take a step without trampling on some creature or another, or to drink a sip of water without swallowing a quantity of small organisms. Leibniz is an intermediary between the Middle Ages and modern times. He is, as I've called him, the philosophical Tycho Brahe, but precisely because of his indecision, he remains to this day the idol of all those who lack the energy to make up their minds. Already in my first edition of 1837, I not only criticized Leibniz's theological attitude, but took the occasion to criticize theology in general. The standpoint from which I criticized it was Spinozan, or rather, an abstract philosophical standpoint. I drew a sharp distinction between man's theoretical and practical attitudes, identifying the former with philosophy, the latter with theology and religion. In his practical attitude, I said, man relates things only to himself, to his own profit and advantage. In his theoretical attitude, he considers things only in relation to each other. Consequently, I went on, there is a necessary and essential difference between theology and philosophy. To mix the two is to mix essentially different attitudes, and the result can only be a monstrosity. Reviewers of my book were greatly disturbed by this distinction, but they overlooked the fact that Spinoza in his theological, political treatise already considered and criticized theology and religion from the same standpoint, and that even if Aristotle himself had criticized theology, he could not have criticized it differently. As a matter of fact, the standpoint from which I criticized theology at the same time is not that of my later works. It was not my ultimate and absolute standpoint, but only relative and historically conditioned. Accordingly, in the new edition of my exposition and critique of Leibniz's philosophy, I criticize Leibniz's theodicy and theology, as well as his related pneumatology, or doctrine of spirit, in a different way. Warranted hopes, expecting to find an eloquent and brilliant speaker. Since thus far I've communicated with the public exclusively through my written works, since I've devoted my happiest hours, my best energies, and my whole mind to my writings, and owe my name and reputation to them alone, it seems only natural that I should take my books as the foundation and guideline of these lectures. Accordingly, they will serve as my text. My role in speaking will be that of a commentator. My purpose, then, in delivering these lectures is to explain, to elucidate, to demonstrate what I've said in my books. What makes this seem all the more fitting is that I tend to write with the utmost brevity and succinctness confidable to give a brief survey of my literary work as a whole. My works can be divided into two groups, those dealing with philosophy as such, and those concerned more specifically with religion or the philosophy of religion. To the first group belong my history of modern philosophy from Bacon to Spinoza, my Leibniz, my Pierre Bailey, a Gentlemen, I call your attention to that fact. Remember, if you please, that I've spent the better part of my life not on a speaker's platform, but in the country, not in the lecture hall, but in the temple of nature, not in drawing rooms and reception chambers, but in the solitude of my study. I should not like you to attend my lectures with unmining myself to the most necessary and essential, omitting all tedious transitions leaving all self-evident parentheses and consecutive clauses to the reader's intelligence, 
thereby exposing myself to extreme misunderstandings, as the critics of my works amply demonstrate. But before I name the works I have chosen as the text of these lectures, it seems advisable